Hi, this is Pastor Dan Kramer from Zion Christian Church in Pittsburgh. This program will give you a glimpse into the life of an amazing group of people who are seeing God do tremendous things. We trust that you're encouraged by our rich worship service and the ministry of God's Word. We'd love to have you visit with us here some Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We'd love to make you welcome, and I know the Holy Spirit would encourage you. We take time in His presence to enjoy Him. Love to have you do that with us here at Zion Christian Church. But Father, we just want to thank you today and thank you that we could be together here in your presence. We ask you, Lord, that you would bless this reading of your word. We ask you, Lord, that you would touch our hearts and lives. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Today, I'm going to be sharing about the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And I'd like to read Romans chapter 1, verses 15 through 17, where it says this, at least in uh, 15 and 16 here. So for my part, this is the Apostle Paul, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And the Apostle Paul, as he is writing this, he, he's making a bold declaration that he's eager to preach the gospel. You know, we have a message that we should be excited about. We should understand how important the gospel is and that we've been entrusted with a commission to present what Christ did to a, for a guilty world to other people. And so we, too, we should be eager to allow people to understand what the Lord Jesus has accomplished for us and for them. Paul said, I'm eager. I have an excitement. I have an expectation. You know, sometimes we have a fear about sharing our faith. But God doesn't want us to have a fear about us. He wants us to have an expectation about it, that uh, an eagerness to, because the gospel has the ability to transform a life. And most of us, if not all of us in this room, are evidence of that. Our lives have been changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Uh, the gospel is something that, that I'm not going to back down when the world puts pressure on me to conform to its ways. I, I'm not ashamed of the Lord Jesus. I'm not ashamed to, uh, to acknowledge what he has, means in my life and what he has done for me. We shouldn't be ashamed of, of our birthright as Christian people and what Jesus has accomplished for us. People need to know, and one time you needed to know. They say the average person hears the gospel seven times before they make a commitment to Christ. So maybe you're voice number three in those seven times, you know? And you come away discouraged because you didn't see the response that you hoped that you would see. No, no that's not how it works. Uh, we're, we're sowing the seed, and that's how it works. It takes time. But we, we need to realize that we can't be ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. You, know, you can look across uh, the whole spectrum of relationships that you have with unsafe people, you can see the, the whole spectrum from those whom you would consider least likely to give their life to Christ to those who may, you may consider closest to giving their life to Christ. But the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. That includes the people you think it's impossible that they would ever come to Christ. That includes them too. If they believe... They, there's this life-changing, eternity-altering quality of the gospel. And we have been entrusted with the proclamation of that. And so the Apostle Paul says, 
I am eager to preach the gospel to you. He's writing to those in Rome, of course. But I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. For in it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. So what does that mean? It, it means this. It may mean other things as well. God's righteousness, now God, righteousness is a word that actually means right standing. The right standing that Christ died to give us with God, the righteousness of God that he's talking about is revealed from faith to faith. It's revealed from your faith to create faith in someone else who hasn't had it. This right standing that we have with God, not based on our works, but based on Christ's cross, is revealed as we proclaim this gospel that we are not ashamed of. It's revealed and uh, from our faith to the faith of other people. Most of us in this room, if not all, receive the gospel, the saving gospel of Christ, through somebody else. It may have been on a television, or it may have been in a book, or most likely it was from another person that you know their faith, creating faith in you as they explain to you the, the power of the gospel, the life-changing quality, what it means to have your sins forgiven, what it means to have hope in this life, that God is actually in charge and has a plan. You know, this is all part of what's involved in the gospel. And it comes as your faith is imparted to become faith in other people who don't have it. And so we look for opportunities to be eager to share the gospel of Christ with other people. When we lived in Sheffield, England, and we were starting our second church there, uh, it, I remember it was Christmas time, and we were in this little mall area. It wasn't actually a mall. It was just a little set of shops that, that had like a, a covered walkway between the shops, and part of it was exposed to the outside. Part of it was, uh, had a, this covered walkway. But there was a, a, a music that was being broadcast through the entire area. And uh, I, somehow I had the boldness to go find the person in charge and ask them if I could say something to all the shoppers that were there. And amazingly to me, they said yes. I mean, they didn't know me from anybody, you know? I mean, who, uh, so uh, as this uh, opportunity, Charlene and I went back into this little room. I took the microphone and I just began to share about how good Jesus is. And, you know, uh, I, I was eager to do that. I actually never dreamed they would allow me to do that, but I was eager to do it. And I don't know whatever happened. You know, eventually someone came to the door and knocked and complained, and I had to stop. <laughs> but we have to look for opportunities. Another thing happened when we lived in Sheffield. I, I took an adult education course, a night course, not for credit, on uh, uh, American history in the 20th century. I did it to be able to just meet people and share the gospel. Little did I know that <laughs> this was being taught by a Marxist communist who believed that religion was the source of all the evil in the world. <laughs> And America was in the center of it, in his mind. Uh, you know, in England, you can't hide if you're an American. I mean, you don't even have to open your mouth. I mean, your clothes give you away, let alone your, your accent gives you away. So there I am, an American preacher, sitting in this class taught by a communist who's, who's basically his view of American history is everything that was ever bad happened because of Christianity. <laughs> I kept my mouth shut for quite a while. But I was eager to preach the gospel. And the last day of the class, he turned to me and he said, Dan, 
I know you're a Christian pastor. You've been in this class this whole time. What do you think? And this was my opportunity. This is what I'd been eager for all this time. I said to him, I, you know, I don't remember word for word, but I, I just remember generally saying, you know, Christians in America and anywhere else haven't been perfect. And I want to apologize for the ways that the body of Christ has not been a good witness. But I said to them, you will never find fault with Jesus. And I just began to explain why Jesus came. You know, looking for opportunities. I need to do more of this kind of thing. I'm getting myself excited here. I'm here to preach the gospel. Carriage Park and other places. Gary, we have something exciting. We have something that needs to be shared. It comes from our faith to other people's faith. And it may take seven times. It may take more, but keep sharing. I'm not ashamed. It's the power of God for salvation. Well, why do we need the power of God for salvation? Really good reason. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2. Our sins have separated us from God. <laughs> but your iniquities have made a separation between you and God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. This is why we need the power of God for salvation. We are guilty. Every one of us has sinned and stands before God guilty, guilty as charged. And we cannot change the things that we have done that are wrong. They are historically recorded in uh, the memory of God until Christ erases them from there by the shedding of his blood. We are condemned for the things that we have done, and we cannot change the reality that it is true. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That includes you. That includes me. We stand guilty. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So here we have what we have earned and deserved, which is sin and death. That's what we have earned. That's what we deserve. We can't change it. We are powerless to do anything about it. Our, we can never have enough good deeds to offset and make us acceptable to God. All the religions of the world, except for Christianity, are on the basis that we have to make ourselves good enough to, uh, to be acceptable to God. It's impossible. Christianity is the only religion in the world that God says, I am going to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. I'm going to send my son to bear your sins and die upon the cross to pay the price for your forgiveness. See, it, it, Christianity is radically different than anything else. Radically different. I remember sitting in the home of a Nepali man who was a Hindu, and I had a friend with me, and he said to me, he was an older man, a, a great student of their scriptures, and he said to me, I've read the Bible. He nodded very knowingly. He goes, same. It's the same. My friend says, what part? <laughs> It's not the same. It's not the same at all. Uh, Christianity is God looks at our helpless condition, and he says, you will never be able to do enough good deeds to be acceptable in my sight. I am going to take care of this problem for you. I'm going to send my son to take care of your sin, to die in your place, to bear the penalty that you deserve, that I could accept you isn't that wonderful? Isn't, isn't that something that needs to be shared? Isn't that something that we should be eager to tell people about and look for opportunities to, to let people know that they can have this miracle take place in their life? Whosoever. 
Another thing about the gospel is, we've been talking about this, God loves us and he sent his son to die for us. I'm so thankful that Jesus didn't let us get what we deserved. But God so loved this world. You know, this world needs love. Uh, this world, I mean, there are... There is such evil in this world today. I mean, it's just unbelievable the acceleration of darkness over the earth. I mean, things that are commonplace that in my mother's generation she would have fainted. How many of you know what I'm talking about? She would have literally fainted if she'd have heard some of the things that are happening today, and public opinion is trying to make it okay. Man. The world needs told the truth, but the world needs told the truth in love. They need to know that there is a moral standard that God holds. And that there is a penalty for sin. And that there is a Savior who cares about them regardless of whatever things they have committed. Yes. That's part of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. I cannot undo the sins that I have done. You cannot undo the sins that you have done. But Christ had the power of the cross to blast us out of that environment of standing guilty before God and not forgiven. I had a conversation yesterday with somebody who came to help clean, who doesn't normally do that. And she said to me, Pastor Dan, do you think I'll be in heaven? Wow, what a question. So I said, you know, if you love Jesus, if you give your life to Jesus, of course you will be in heaven. And she said, uh, I, think, I think I'm going to be in hell. And I said, we don't, we don't want that, you know. And that doesn't have to be. That doesn't have to be. She said, but I've done things that are wrong is what she was saying. I've done things that are wrong. So I said to her, you know, heaven is not going to be made up of perfect people. Heaven is going to be made up of forgiven people. Forgiven people. So you remember that. And you better end up there. That's what, you know, you better end, she's my niece, you know, my Vanji. You better end up there. But that's the power of God unto salvation. That we who were guilty, we who had committed sin, we who cannot change it, we who have a sentence of judgment written over us, find freedom and release from all of our sins by believing and trusting what Christ has done for us upon his cross and his resurrection. It's wonderful. God, the best known verse in the Bible is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I grew up in church. I was there every week, nine months before I was born. That's just the way my family was. The only problem was it wasn't a church that the, taught the gospel in. So it wasn't until I was 16 years old that I personally, I mean, being around it every week, week in, week out, reciting the Apostles' Creed, taking communion, you know, just the whole thing, I was lost. I didn't know God. I had an intellectual understanding of the crucifixion, but I had no experiential understanding of the crucifixion. I was lost. But when I gave my life to Christ, I knew when he came in my life. 
And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. My brother helped me believe in Christ, challenged me that it was time to give my life to him. I'd been running from God. It was time to stop. He was my brother, you know, my big brother. He led me in some other ways before he led me in that. But I'm glad he led me in that, you know. And when I prayed what you might call the sinner's prayer, to ask God to forgive me of my sins and give my life to him, give him control of my life. I felt so clean, so forgiven, so related to God. I mean, I, I knew he was real. I had a relationship with him. And that relationship with him has been the center of my life from that time on until now. You see, that gospel blasted me out of the wages of sin is death and ushered me into the kingdom of his dear son. That gospel delivered me from Satan having a hand upon my life and brought me into being a child of God with a relationship with him. That gospel brought repentance to me where I didn't want to do the sins that I'd committed anymore. I, I wanted to please God. I wanted to live a good life. I'm not perfect at it, for sure, just like no one else is. But that's the sail that's filled with wind and taking me through life. I do want to please him. And I know that when I do sin and mess up, I can come and ask his forgiveness, and he'll forgive me once again. That gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It blasted me out of Satan's realm blasted me out of guilt, blasted me out of not knowing the Lord, gave me a beautiful relationship with him. See, our sins are forgiven when we believe. Some of us have been Christians for such a long time, we forget how powerful that really is. There, there are people who don't know what to do with their guilt who commit suicide. They know they're guilty. They don't know what to do about it. You know, there's a better way. And our sins are forgiven when we believe. And again, I want to remind you, the gospel it says that it's transmitted from faith to faith. So tell people about this. Christ forgives sins. Everyone has sins. Christ forgives sins. Let people know. Our sins are forgiven when we believe. The Bible says that he does not remember our sins anymore. It doesn't say he forgets our sins. There's a difference. And it's a beautiful difference. Forgetting our sins means that God doesn't have all knowledge. So we know if he wanted to remember them, he could, if he chose to. But remembering, not calling our sins to remembrance is a different matter. I will not bring your sins to my memory anymore. That's a different matter. He doesn't forget them. He won't bring them to his memory anymore. He brings something else to his memory when we are, are being accused before him or when we mess up. He brings to his memory the reality that his son hung upon a cross and died there for our forgiveness. That, that's the memory that he brings. And that's the memory that you need to bring. Rather than dwelling on, oh, I did this, and I did that, and I did this, and I did that. Why don't you start remembering what Christ did? Bring that to your memory. Bring that to your memory. How many of you know there's great freedom in that? Freedom. I love that freedom. Great freedom. 
God loves us, and he sent his son to die for us. Take a look at a couple of these scriptures here. Colossians chapter 2 tells us this. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, how many of you know that's not a very complimentary picture of the unsaved, but that's where we all were, dead in our transgressions and the uncircumcision of our flesh. He made you alive together with him, having forgiven us how many of our transgressions? Most? The ones we committed before we were 40? Uh, well, yes, but that's not all. All, all, all our transgressions. All, all. So when you stand before him, how many do you have to be worried about? None. None. A lot of people said all, but only one person said none. All of our transgressions are forgiven. So when we stand before him, we don't have to be conscious of any. I mean, isn't that incredible? I mean, that is like the best deal ever given anywhere to anyone at any time in all of human history. That's what that is. It's the best deal where we commit our lives to him. He forgives us of our sins. He works in our lives. And we stand before him clean and pure. I've used this illustration before, but it, it says it. If you were on trial for a crime that you committed and the penalty was death and you knew it, and you and everyone else in the courtroom knew that you were guilty, and you stand before the judge for your sentencing, and there's only one sentence in your mind that he could possibly give, guilty, death. But the judge turns to you and says, you know, you did commit this crime. You do deserve to die. But if you'll let me, I will take your place. I mean, who in that position would say, maybe later, or when I get older, or let me think about it? But isn't that, what, isn't that the miracle of the gospel? The judge, the judge and the jury, that's who God is, says to us, you are guilty as charged, and there is a penalty to pay but I will pay it on your behalf. And we would go, why? What, what, what doesn't make sense? What, how, why would you? And he just says, you're never going to understand this completely, but I have loved you with an everlasting love. And I want you to give your life to me. Why would anyone say no? Except that men prefer darkness to light. But that's the gospel. Our sins are forgiven. 1 Peter 2, 24, and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds we were healed. See, that, that gospel, the power of God unto salvation, for, brings forgiveness to our sins. It, it, it takes away the penalty that we have deserved of judgment. It gives us a relationship with God that we enjoy. And furthermore, the Holy Spirit enters our lives when we believe. The Holy Spirit comes and develops internally within us a relationship with himself where we are aware of his presence and aware of his goodness and aware of his glory. And that's what we have to learn to live in. Ephesians chapter 1, 13 to 14. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit seals the whole thing. 
in our lives. And we enjoy his companionship as we go. Now, we can ignore his companionship. We can grieve him. You know, we can not pay attention. But if we're doing what we should and we're yielded to him, he's with us on a daily basis and, and we get his nudges and we get the different things, you know, that, uh, that the Lord is, is capable of doing. Um, and what a joy. One of the things that this season has brought people to, hopefully it's brought us to, is a new purity in our relationship with God. A new simplicity in our approach to the gospel of Christ. A new dependence upon him. I'm so thankful that the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation, when I wake up in the morning, I have hope. And you do too. Whatever it looks like around you, we have hope. We're not subject to the depression that so many are facing at this time, or at least we don't have to be subject to it. Because we can get close to God. And we can begin to honor God and worship God. We can read his word. We can align our lives to please him and enjoy his company, his companionship, and his presence. That's a, a spring of living water that bubbles up within our lives, and, and nothing can take it away from us. We, we can walk away from it to a point, but nothing can take it away from us. It's there because he's there, because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. And it's given from faith to faith, this righteousness, this new right standing with God that's based on what Christ accomplished for us. That's the righteousness of God. And it's conveyed from one person's faith to another person's faith. And I want to tell you, if this thing continues to linger, there are going to be more and more people who are going to be anxious to hear what you have to say about Christ. Because there are people who are thinking it's pretty hopeless right now. You might be the answer God is sending into their lives to talk to them, to proclaim in whatever way that Jesus is the answer. So I trust that you have made that commitment. To follow Christ, we too have to take up a cross. We too. Mark chapter 8, verse 34, he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. To take up our cross, there are things that we have to deny ourselves of. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So there are things that is very important that we deny ourselves of. And that's where repentance comes in, where we make deliberate choices to end the things in our lives that we know are displeasing to God. That's repentance. We make deliberate choices to embrace the things in our lives that we know are pleasing to God. We deny ourselves. We, we see change coming into our life. We get victory over habits and bondages of different types. We learn to walk in the Spirit and not grieve the Holy Spirit but live a life that's pleasing to him. We don't only learn that once, you know. 
Throughout our lives, we learn it consistently. Consistently learning to find forgiveness for the mistakes we make along the way, because none of us are perfect. To take up that cross and say, Father, I'm, I'm going to change. I'm going to change. Help me to change. Let the power of the gospel bring change in my life, that I may honor you by the way I live. And then that way, we too have a cross that we have to take up. That cross is just about denying ourselves things that we wouldn't necessarily want to deny ourselves of, but for his sake, and for our sake, we do. So I just want everyone to take a moment to bow your head and close your eyes. And we're just going to pray. And if somehow you're in this room and you're not totally sure that you have really encountered Jesus in salvation, this is the day you can. I'm just going to lead in a prayer. Uh, you know, just be honest with yourself. Can you recall the time that you personally asked him to forgive you of your sins and gave him charge of your life? If you can't, it's extremely important that you do that today. It's extremely important. You, you don't want the judge to be saying, I'll take your place, and you say, no, that's okay. So I want you to pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for what you've done for me. Please forgive me of my sins. I've messed up. I'm sorry. I won't blame other people. I, I take ownership of my sins. And I say, Lord, I have let you down. But I thank you that that's why Christ came to do for me what I could never do for myself. My good works can't offset my sins, but Christ's work paid the price. And Jesus, I want to thank you today that you paid the price for me. Your death bought my freedom, paid my penalty, Open the door to an amazing relationship with God. And today, I ask your forgiveness. Come into my life. I surrender myself to you. And I thank you that you receive me. Today, I make the decision, Lord. Here I am. Have all of me. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. If you prayed that, please let us know. So we want to make sure that uh, we can get a Bible in your hands and want to make sure that we can help you to grow. But please remember, you have been entrusted with the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. Don't be ashamed of it. God's righteousness, this right standing we enjoy, is revealed from faith to faith. You're his voice. You're his hands. You're the salt. You're the light. He's trusted you with that. Isn't that awesome? Look for the opportunities that he might give you. 
to help other people know how good he really is. And one way that can open a door that I personally have never had anyone say no to is when someone's hurting, asking if I can pray with them. I've had people refuse tracts. I've had people refuse Bibles. I've had people refuse conversations. But I've never had anyone refuse, can I pray with you when they're hurting? I've never had anyone refuse that. What a beautiful open door, amen? Because then you can begin to talk to them about, not only pray for them, but begin to tell them, you know, you need to trust Jesus. Call upon him. Give your life to him. He loves you. He cares about you. He's here. He'll meet with you. Your faith, creating faith in the word of God, in the lives of other people. Amen? Amen. Looking here at a mighty army. Praise the Lord. Like Gideon, you may be going, where? You know? Gideon says, the angel, the Lord comes and says, hail mighty man of valor to Gideon. And he's like, where's that guy? You know, I'm hiding out here in a little place trying to beat up a little grain for myself. I don't feel like a mighty man of valor. You know, God sees in you what he's put in you, even when you don't see it, amen? Mighty people, mighty army of God. So thank you. And Lord, we just ask as we go forth from this place, I pray that the joy of the Lord will be the strength of this congregation. Please, Lord, let the joy of the Lord. I pray, Lord, that when this congregation wakes up tomorrow, they choose your joy. Not discouragement, not depression, not negative things but choose to live out of that relationship with the Holy Spirit that's part of our salvation we've been born again there's a new principle of life within us there's a river of life that doesn't end there's a spring there's a well that springs up within our soul of living water, refreshing, encouraging. Lord, just release it over people in Jesus' name. Lord, help people to major on the majors and trust you with the minors. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you peace. Well, hello, everybody. just want to thank you for taking time to watch our video here today. We have a wonderful group of people who enjoy the presence of the Lord and, and love being together. Here we have two services at 10 o'clock in the morning and at 12 o'clock in the afternoon each Sunday. It's been a really difficult time in our nation, but God tells us in His Word that He prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. And when we meet together, come into the presence of the Lord with each other in a clean environment that has been sanitized, we worship Him and we find Him present. And that table that He prepares when people meet together in Jesus' name is so good. So I just want to encourage you Come and visit us. We have children's programming at our 10 o'clock service each week in nursery. And at our noon service, we only have adults at this time. But God bless you. I hope you enjoyed this video. Hope you enjoy the blessing and the presence of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>